Okay, good morning. Thank you for joining today. Uh, we've got a really interesting panel uh, today on investing in health to yield long-term economic benefits. Uh, now, I hope I won't be doing our panelists an injustice by keeping their long and distinguished uh, CVs very short, um, because I'm very keen to move on to the conversation, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so we have at the end over there, we've got Professor E.K. Yu. Uh, he is currently at the Chinese University of Hong Kong as the director for the Center for Health Systems and Policy Research. He's also the former secretary for health, welfare, and food uh, for the Hong Kong government, also advisor to WHO. Uh, we also have Professor Margaret Foster Riley, who is a professor of law, public health sciences, and uh, public policy at the University of Virginia. We also have Professor Mina Kang, uh, who is a uh, professor in the Department of Public Administration at Iwa Women's University. And here we have uh, Professor Yik Ying Tiu who is the Dean at the Sorsui Hock School of Public Health at the University of Singapore. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for joining today. Um, and I find with uh, these kind of discussions, it's good to really start with, you know, looking at what's essentially at stake. And I, I think we can maybe start with Professor Kang here, uh, just to maybe explain why uh, resilient health systems are so integral to maintaining a healthy economy. So why don't you kick us off? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this valuable opportunity to uh, talk about my understanding of resilient health system and how it can contribute to a healthy economy. Well, most importantly, um, resilient health system can um, contribute to a healthy economy by safeguarding individuals, not only patients, workers, or healthcare providers, but also consumers, decision makers, and implementers, as well as businesses from closures or, or disruptions. In addition, there are many other ways that resilient health system can contribute to a healthy economy, including, first of all, resilient health systems are better prepared to respond to health emergencies. A society with the resilient health systems have the capacity to detect and manage threats, mobilize resources efficiently, and implement effective response measures, which can minimize disruptions to economic activities, safeguarding the functioning of essential sectors, and reducing economic losses. Also, a resilient health system can protect workers. A healthy workforce is crucial for a productive economy. Resilient health system can ensure this workforce can access to quality health care, preventive measures, and necessary and timely medical interventions, which can contribute to reduced absenteeism, increased productivity, and uninterrupted functioning of businesses and industries. Also, during a health crisis, business can face many challenges related to health and well-being or their well employees and dis disruption in the supply chains and changes in consumer behavior. In addition, a resilient health system can control healthcare costs by prioritizing preventive care, early detection, and management of diseases, which can free up resources for other sectors in the, in the economy. And most importantly, a resilient health system can promote confidence and trust. Resilient health systems can foster public confidence and trust in the government institutions and as well as healthcare system. When individual, we all know that when individual have trust in their government, they can be more likely to seek necessary healthcare services, follow public health guidelines, and cooperate with contained measures. Well, having said that, I'd like to ask a little bit further, and then asking you, what sets resilient, quote unquote, resilient health systems apart from conventional health systems? One of the most critical characteristics of a resilient health system actually is the decision to prioritize sustainability, transformation, and flexibility over mere efficiency. Let me give you two examples. 
The first one of the components that for the resilient health system, according to many literature, says that maintaining diversity and redundancy is critical for resilient system. Well, let's talk about redundancy. Usually, we consider redundancy as a waste, which should be reduced to maintain efficiency. But many scholars argue that redundancy, when combined into diversity, can act as an insurance when there is a loss and failures in some of the some part of the society. And also another intriguing component of resilience system is the presence of slow variables, such as social factors encompassing legal systems, values, traditions, cultures, so and deeply rooted customs. These elements can contribute to society. There's a system strength, consolidation, long-term sustainability, particular in time of crisis. Well, during a crisis, our attention often lean towards some of the immediate variables like prompt response and how to be efficient in making our decisions. Paradoxically, the literature says that the these slow variables are most significant in times of crisis and these because these aspects provide a social framework that supports resilience and ensures stability even in the face of adverse adversity. Well, thinking about the slow variable gives us one valuable lesson for all of us. During the last painful three years, we have all made some type of mistakes. We all However, we all succeeded in different ways also. In the end, we were all resilient. And we have learned and hopefully will not repeat the same mistakes as these painful experiences taught us how important these quote unquote slow variables such as our values, cultures, community, and tradition. So hopefully I emphasize enough what is resilient health system and how it can contribute to a healthy economy. Thank you. And maybe we should focus on a specific place. Uh, looking at Hong Kong, Professor Yeo, um, of course, Hong Kong had experience with SARS. Uh, how resilient was Hong Kong's health system to the pandemic and what role did that play in maintaining uh, its robust economy? Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I'll be talking from my, my background in my four careers as a clinician, and then moving on managing the Hong Kong's health system, and then in policy managing the outbreak during SARS, and then now my fourth career, and I hope my last, as an academic. Um, I think it's quite interesting because, I, because of the, 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 the time required, I'll be going on also to talk about the, how health systems uh, should be managed. I think in, in Hong Kong during 2003, and there's these colleagues here that were all shared experience, uh, we obviously went through a very different experience. But after that, we had a, a, an expert review, and then we revamped the system. We invested in infection control beds, because when I was managing the system, uh, we only had like 100 uh, infection control uh, beds uh, for, for um, uh, patients with SARS, so it was impossible to manage. So we built 1,400. Uh, infection control beds. We set up a new agency of Center for uh, Disease Protection in Hong Kong. Uh, we also uh, gave the universities $500 million uh, to do uh, infectious disease uh, uh, research. So those are some of the infrastructures. And then we also made sure that we had uh, supply, three months supply of personal protection equipment for our health systems. Uh, that that uh, was very good when the uh, COVID first broke, so we were able to control it. We had different waves. We had been periods where we had no cases for three months, and then we suddenly had this big outbreak of, uh, of Omicron in uh, 2021, and the whole system was overwhelmed. So whatever preparedness you do, uh, you can never anticipate the unanticipated. And there must be not just search capacity, but contingencies. Because during contingencies, when this thing exceeds your ability to manage incrementally, you cannot continue to do more of the same. So you've got to really review all your systems. And 
going on to uh, healthcare in Hong Kong, and we have invested a lot of money. Uh, the, the amount of money we put it into healthcare is now about 7.5% 7, 7 of GDP. It used to be about five, and it's gone up so much. And yet, we continue to have problems. We have long waiting times for, to get a consultation. Uh, we have uh, problems of, of, uh, of uh, uh, long-term care uh, that patients, because we do not invest in the right places. So it's not just amount money of what you invest, but how you invest and how that money is being spent, the, the return on investments. And I think for the future health systems globally, not just in Hong Kong, because we, yesterday we heard about all the commonalities of countries, developing, develop, uh, de de uh, undeveloped countries, they all have the same problems. Right? They're about human resources, about management, about governance, about uh, the demands, the technology advances, uh, and the, the expectations of the community, and also lifestyle-related problems. So to me, I think future health systems will look at three things, the what, the why, and the how. And to me, the important thing now is we should be talking about precision health, not precision medicine. It's about, not about disease, but about illness, not about mobility, but about health, not even about population health, but individual wellness. So one of the problems in public health, we talk about population health. We think that everyone is the same, but we are not. It's the individual experience. What is it important for me as an, as an individual that's important? What does wellness mean to me, not to the population? So we do a lot of these things that are aggregated, but they have no meaning to the person that's going through the, the life experience. So I think that's quite important in terms of changing our paradigms of how we deliver care, how we, how we um, actually govern care, how we finance it, and how we research it. And then th there are also the why is beyond social determinants, because there's no talk about social determinants, but there are intermediate determinants in terms of why we are well or not, the education, occupation, material resources, and health systems. And it, it, the pathways are the exposure to uh, life threats, vulnerability, the access and the impact, and it's different for each, each of the different socioeconomic groups, the inequity in our system, social justice that you talk about. It affects each person individually. These are still aggregate, but it's the individual coping, the biologic coping of myself, the behavioral coping of myself, and then also defining myself in terms of what does health mean to me and wellness means to me, which is to me is important. And there have been estimates of a productivity loss of inequity, that in UK, they found that 31 billion pounds a year is productive loss from inequities. In the European Union, economic growth is affected by 1.9% of GDP from inequity, welfare losses of 9.4%. Uh, and they're also not just that, but human costs and the value of humanity, which is important. So those are the so-called the outputs and what we should be aiming at. Then I finally talk about the how. I think we should have a person defined, not person centered, how we define our integrated health systems, how the person defines it and how we organize it. And WHO talks about financing, resource, delivery and govern. But we also need to look at how these things are designed, organized, researched and implemented in partnership with people. And to also within that, the outputs would be the, the policies need to appreciate our own shared humanity. humanity. Because it's each, of, each of us, the value of human life, we, we, in many of our developed countries, we only look at the productivity, we look at the, what drives the economy, we don't look at the, so the human costs of the millions of people, the majority of people that will never make it into the top 1%. It's, and the 99% is what counts. It's not the 1%. The 1% contributes to the economy. One provides the resource to support it. But the, re the policies enable pe that 1% to, to, to capture that 99% of the economy. But then how do they actually contribute? Why should policies not look at the individuals that are not up there in the, will never be so the, the experts, the people that sit up here, the, the people that are not even in this room. They are equally important. To me, that's what health systems should be all about. Thank you.
Now, talking about parallels, Singapore is often compared to Hong Kong in terms of size, uh, population, but of course had many differences in its uh, COVID approach. So how was Singapore able to uh, contain COVID, Professor Tsu, and uh, keep its economy open? And would this have been replicable in other countries? Thanks very much, Jennifer. So I think Singapore's experience was very much like what EK talked about. As a small island country, I think there are many things that we could do, but equally like Hong Kong. As a small but very dense country, we are at much greater pressure when you have an infectious disease such as COVID-19. We did experience SARS just like Hong Kong did, and I think we learned a lot from it. We also had H1N1 in 2009. So that actually led the Singapore government to have a much more forward-looking lens in terms of pandemic preparedness. For example, we have a National Centre for Infectious Disease that was just started in September of 2019, three months before COVID-19 hit Singapore. So I think that, that really helped. And in fact, because of SARS, all the public hospitals in Singapore will undergo annual drills, very much like military drills, where there are simulations of an outbreak. And hospitals are then required to be able to advance their operations from the frontline workers to notice that there looks like, it looks like there is an outbreak happening and it activates a pandemic, an outbreak response within the hospital. So I think those have helped Singapore managed SARS in the very early days. We also benefited from a country or government that has an economic war chest that was built up over generations. So from an economic perspective, making sure that lives and livelihoods, which were commonly talked about during the pandemic, were maintained as much as possible. So we put in place financial support, to all the frontline workers, including taxi drivers, food delivery workers, which will be at the highest risk of an infection, to make sure that any economic loss from not being able to carry out the professions will be supported by the government. And you immediately see that this helped to maintain a degree of infection control within the community. So the government, in a way, I like to think that our government is pretty technocratic. They tend to, to look at problems from a solutioning space. And so there's a lot of investment in public health that has been put in since the founding of Singapore. And because of that, we recognise that when, when COVID-19 hit Singapore, it was not just a health problem, but it was actually a problem that was spent across multiple government ministries, agencies, and also multiple sectors. And in fact, the solutioning actually has to incorporate all these partnerships from the multiple sectors. I talk about what the government, the public hospitals have done, but equally, the resilience that uh, Mina talks about was actually provided through the, the cooperation from the military response, through even the participation from the civilians in helping to perform contact tracing, to perform temperature screening, and so on. So I think that help, and Singapore, we, we do benefit from a high degree of trust between the people and the government. And that meant that a lot of the problems that Malcolm talked about in his plenary speech around the distrust in government state actors, we typically do not have that because I believe that our government, we were happy, very privileged to have a government that was very responsible in the way it communicated to the public based on evidence, based on data and facts that have been collated through scientists, not just from Singapore, but international science, including guidance from the WHO. But that's not also to say that Singapore did everything right. And I think there were areas that we have identified that we could have improved. And in fact, we have an after action review and the white paper has been published publicly and you can download it. I think there are operational issues that have gone wrong. And I think that it's common for many countries in the world. Operationally, things have gone wrong. I think I will not dwell on where we have gone wrong, but rather look at the systems level issues that we could have done better. And one is actually around the, the lens on equity, because health equity was one area that we realised that we could have done a lot better, because one of the biggest problems in Singapore during COVID-19 was the outbreak that affects the migrant workers. So that's one area that we are now looking at improving better. The second area that we could have done better is actually in understanding what is the framework for decision-making 
in moments of crisis, particularly in terms of where the data is going to come from. For example, in terms of border controls, were we right to close borders or were we too slow to close borders? And were we supposed to take a graduated approach in deciding border closures to against which countries, which territories first of, or afterwards? So I think those are areas that we can done better. But I'll just end off by saying, looking forward, what, could, what are we trying to do now in trying to improve some of the gaps that we found? I think the first thing is, like what EK talked about, uh, I'm very envious that Hong Kong government released a $500 million fund to support your, your investment to pandemic preparedness. Singapore has done that as well. It's not $500 million, it's $100 million. So uh, <laughs> perhaps we're a little bit more prudent. <laughs> uh, but we have $100 million looking into three areas on the basic science of response against, for example, vaccine development, uh, uh, therapeutics development around uh, implementation sciences, including analytics and modeling, which has been particularly helpful during COVID-19. And last, really looking at building regional networks, including perhaps some of the partnerships with Capri. Now, the second area that Singapore has improved is actually to restructure some of our, our pandemic preparedness and communicable disease responses into one single agency that will look at both the clinical response as well as the public health response. And trying to merge this in a communicable disease agency has been one of the, the development post COVID-19. And the last is really, I talk about the gap that we have around migrant workers. And we now have a migrant workers health register, which is quite a significant step forward in really being able to track the, the health of all the migrant workers that are in Singapore and contributing to the growth and economic growth of Singapore. Now, Jennifer, the second part of the question was actually, are there lessons that Singapore has that would be transferable to other, other jurisdictions, other countries? And I think those lessons have been broadcast during COVID-19 by the WHO in weekly sessions by Dr. Tedros, by Dr. Somnia Swaminathan, the chief health scientist, to many jurisdictions and countries that are part of the United Nations WHO. And I think what is important to highlight is that Many of the lessons are very useful and generic, but recognizing the context specificity is very important. What work well in jurisdictions like Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong may not work well in North America and Europe. And we have to recognize that because otherwise we will always run this problem of the East criticizing the West, the West criticizing the East, without really understanding or looking from each other's perspective. Why didn't this work? perhaps simply because the trust between the government and the people were, were never there in the first place. Now, I think earlier on, Mina also talked about this issue on resilience and sustainability. I think it's more fun if I, I offer a slightly opposite, a differing opinion. And I think when it comes to health systems, a resilient health system could be one that has a lot of search capacity within itself. And over here, I'm not talking about partnerships with other cross sectors, because once you involve the civilians uh, sector and then the military sector, you could build a lot of search capacity in that front. And I think the right form is to involve other sector. But for a health systems in itself to build in resilience, it typically means that there may be a lot of redundancy. And, and Mina, earlier on, you used the phrase redundancy. I worry when health systems have too much redundancy because at the end of the day, health systems need to survive economically. And usually redundant health systems may run the risk of sustainable challenges. Where would the financing come? So I think for crisis management, the search capacity perhaps may have to be provided from other sectors. And I'll just stop there. Over back to you, Jennifer. Great. Uh... So talking about collaboration, uh, maybe Professor Riley, you can speak about the US. How were the policies of the US CDC and other health departments aligned with the economic interests of the country? And which one do you think uh, should take precedence or did take precedence? So this isn't as happy a story as, as the other stories. And I actually want to emphasize, I don't think it's a US story either. I think some of the things I'm gonna talk about here were across the world. Um, and so as we look at this, one of the things we first should think about is, um, were they aligned? Yes, they really were 
aligned. I, I don't think that there may be a few exceptions. I don't think anyone sought to kill the economy. I don't think anyone was hoping that people were going to die. So they, they were aligned, but they weren't coordinated. Um, and some of that has to do with how siloed we are. If you look around this room, we're in a multicultural context, but when we look at government and agencies, you're also in a multicultural context, and it's even worse in academia. Um, so if I'm talking about an economic world, what you're going to see is a different language you're going to see economists looking at different data. You're going to see economists have a very different culture. Until recently, they actually thought people behave rationally. They're learning to, to move off that a little bit. But there's a real belief that that kind of behavior will go on. Um, in public health contexts, um, it's similarly different. Um, you have a different language. They're focused on epidemiology. They're focused on disease transmission. Or, or health more generally, they're not focused on how that's going to necessarily impact the economy. And so that has a, a real effect because they're not talking to each other as they go along. Now, you may remember, um, and this gives me a little bit of PTSD, but right in the beginning of March 2020, there was a broad uh, discussion going on in the press um, on, on national television of we cannot afford to lock down because if we lock down, we will destroy the economy. And on the other side, if we don't lock down, millions, and unfortunately in the United States, millions did die, but millions would die immediately. And that was not the kind of discussion that's needed. What we needed was actually those two groups talking to each other and trying to figure out how to make that work. What would be the right way to do it? Now, one of the issues was that there were no clean lines of authority. Uh, and when I say no clean lines of authority, that's both in the decisional context, but also in who got to be the spokesman for what we should do. As a result, you would hear public health people talk about what we should do because they knew what to do in a public health context, at least to some degree. Um, and you heard economists and others talk about what we should do in an economic context. Um, and some of this is looked at as a problem um, that the United States was somehow unprepared. Uh, and most of you in this room probably know that people thought the United States was the most prepared nation uh, before the pandemic actually happened. And we were prepared. We were prepared for a flu epidemic or pandemic. Uh, now, when you think about the flu, it's very different than COVID. Flu uh, has very few asymptomatic cases. You know when someone's sick. Uh, flu actually also, um, uh, you don't even need to test for it because it's asymptomatic. And it doesn't tr transmit aerosolized in the same way that COVID did. Now, I want to keep an economy open. I want to keep a uh, slaughterhouse open. I want to keep uh, the lines of manufacture open. If I'm in a COVID context, that's a very different decision than I have in flu, where I could just keep the people who look sick home. Um, so one of the things, Mina talks about resiliency, but resiliency is one way to think of resiliency is imagination. And how do we think about how it would affect um, our economy, not just how sick people are? Um, and E.K. talks about the how. You have to actually think about how you're going to operationalize things. You have to not just think, this is what will happen, this is what we will do. Now, if we talk about the economy, I think one thing that uh, is hidden, but I think the most profound economic effects from the COVID pandemic uh, in the United States and possibly globally will be what happened with our schools. Our students are so far behind because of the pandemic, because we didn't have full understanding of how to close things um, or open them. And as a result, we're years behind that we'll have 
uh, trickle-down effects, I'd say 20 years from now. We're going to still be learning from that. So that's another place we need to think about. That doesn't look like economy. That looks like schools, right? But we have to, again, have a cross-cultural conversation that goes between those. And then finally what happens with this lack of ability to speak across lines is what Malcolm Turnbull talked about. It breaks down trust. We were in a world where no one had real certainty uh, and everyone was seeking certainty and you can't actually pretend you have certainty. But you can, by making sure that you are working together in a coordinated fashion and speaking together, you can try to maintain trust. And we did not. Just one quick comment to YY about redundancy, which I think is a great topic for us to you know, discuss uh, at a later time, if we have a chance. But yeah, I was also struck by the concept of redundancy because as I'm a policy, you know, I'm trained as a public policy analyst uh, with economic perspective and redundancy is a clearly a waste and inefficiency. And how can you really understand redundancy is the core component of resilience? Well, I am trying to find the answer, but my, perhaps redundancy with diversity may be the answer. I don't know, in Korea, we have a significant problems of lack of redundancy because our public sector, public health centers were uh, removed or eliminated because of redundancy. And then when the crisis hit, we were in desperate needs of public health centers. So, well, this is going to be a really interesting topic for us to May go for. I also uh, chip in here. I don't think any health system has any redundancy. Because in, in health systems, there's this economic phenomenon of supply-induced demand. So whatever is empty will be filled up. So there's no such thing as, as, as uh, redundancy in, in these developed health systems. Because people just fill up the beds. Because if there are beds, the people will stay longer. If there's services, people will go and attend. There's a lot of inefficiency uh, in the health system. And that's this capacity that needs to be then reined in to identify where these capacities are so that you can realign them, both in terms of the resilience of the ongoing chronic stresses that each health system faces, and when there is an emergency, where do you then reallocate and reassign services? So there's always capacity in the health system and always inefficiency in any health system. And there's tremendous, even in Singapore, when you, you had a very good system where you reassign the, the GP clinics to really do the COVID, COVID tests, so people were, were helping. There's also a lot of resources in the community. So we only think about health systems that we are just the doctors and the nurses and the great health managers and policy makers. But the people that, that are important are the people that we actually treat and the people that use the system. In COVID, I think the global experience has been the community was great. Both the NGOs, the business sector, all rallied. And this is despite government policy. So when, government, when COVID first started, every country just ignored the community and the business sector, and they were just scrambling to help. So when we had the first outbreak, the government imposed a lot of restrictions uh, to, 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 social, so, to social interactions, and there were patients that were, nobody was taking care of. Home care, nobody was providing any home care to the people at home. And uh, the, there were also the individuals that, that needed care, uh, social care, that it was not provided. And government was restricting the workers from doing it, the NGOs from doing it, and the NGOs were clamoring. They were trying to see how can we help, but there was no system. There was no system, no, no preparedness, no understanding of, of who was going to what. And not only that, there were barriers for them to be able to contribute. So I think we, we always do not re recognize the vast community resources, the individuals, the persons in the community, the, the altruism of both business and non-business uh, private sector. And these are a lot of resources in our health systems in a pandemic and in peacetime must be really, really looked at and then harnessed and then embraced by government as part of the health system. Thanks, E.K. And I thought keeping to the theme of this session around investment in health, uh, to you, long-term 
economic benefits, I thought it's useful to actually follow up from what the previous speakers have mentioned. And I think this is exactly the kind of decision making that needs, is needed in government, that decision making, whether it's during crisis or whether it's just in relation to health, must actually adopt a lens where they look at what are the economic cost to a particular decision that's, that's taken. Now, it might sound very cold and hard when I just use the phrase economic cost, but because this is the language that is easier for policymakers to understand. Whether it is in health promotion, whether it is in pandemic response, when the lens is set on human productivity and potential, when the lens is set on economic outcomes, that it's easier to translate. Because when we, when I think, Mimi, you talk about closing schools. Thankfully, we, we didn't close schools for that long. But closing schools come with a cost, which I think many policymakers don't understand. And that cost is a long-term economic cost. Equally, when you don't make the right decisions and you allow COVID-19 to spread across a society, infecting people, killing people, there is an economic impact as well in the loss of lives, in the loss of human productivity potential and so on. And all of that, if you translate it to a common language which policymakers typically understand, which is econ e economic benefits or economic losses, that is exactly the kind of lens that I believe is needed in the health sector for us to try and convince decision makers, policy makers around what is the cost when you make a decision like keeping the schools open or closing schools for a long time? What is the cost when you decide to close the borders? It is not just the impact to, to, to uh, the, the airlines, to the tourist industry, but there may be some economic benefits where you save, where you get from people not being infected. Doing that cost-benefit balancing provides a better judgment for governments to decide, should I take on this decision at this particular point. So I'm going to make one short comment to that and say, um, I think you absolutely have to think about the economic costs and go through it, but boy, you better be careful when you're saying it, at least in my country. Um, <laughs> so um, if, if you start talking about calories and how we're going to measure what, what a life is worth, um, well, Malcolm Turnbull can tell you, you wouldn't be, you're, that's a politician's nightmare. Um, if you want to be reelected, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so um, I think you have to do these equations, but you also have to think really hard about how you're expressing it to the public. I think it'd be important just to pivot slightly, just to think about you know the pandemic and how it exposed uh, a lot of inequalities in, in different societies. And I, I want to go to you, Mina, um, specifically talking about how women can overcome barriers when it comes to accessing public health and what are the long-term benefits of this greater gender equality? Well, thank you very much uh, for asking such an important question. Um, this is an area that needs much more research and evidence generation, especially in Asia-Pacific region where we share similar social norms and values and expectations on gender roles. And I'm gladly, I see quite many women here in the audience, but I expect to be more to, to reach 50% of the audience <laughs> in, the, in our next forum. Well, in order to find solutions, we need to understand what are the barriers for women to access to a necessary public health. There are many. First of all, societal expectations may prioritize women's role as caregivers and prioritize health needs. Women prioritize health needs of other family members than themselves. I'm not sure whether it's good or bad for the society, but that's what we see often. Also, in some, and actually most of Asian cultures, women may have limited decision-making power regarding their holes, the, the health due to hierarchical family structures or societal norms. And what about jobs? Women take jobs, mostly jobs in informal sector, which provides many barriers for the necessary public health services. 
And also, there are some stigma surrounding issues on women's health, cultural taboos, and social judgment may prevent open discussions about women's health issues. And also, geographic barriers, inadequate transportation, limited financial resources for women who are busy taking care of their children, the elderly at the same time, work as a, an, as a worker in their job offices, they have significant uh, barriers to access necessary public health services. And among the factors, social norms and expectations are most significant barriers. We recently conducted a systematic uh, review of public health studies on gender roles. And while women take many important roles as caregivers, uh, health care providers, and so forth, most of the sub-studies uh, describe women as victims or beneficiaries rather than decision makers or enablers, which needs to be changed. We need to change our attitudes, understanding, and social norms and expectations about women, not necessarily as a, the only victims or beneficiaries, but also important decision makers or enablers in this society. What should we do? We first change our social norms and attitudes. Also, we should provide resources for women who, may, who, take, who are taking multiple roles as caregivers. We need more data on gender gap and as well as gendered medicine. What are the impact of uh, these uh, medical services and healthcare services for women? How they are different from men? And most importantly, have more women in decision making, making, making roles. And perhaps Shirley can be our role model for that. OK, so by overcoming these barriers for women to access public health services, we can truly achieve the genuine resilient society, which values diversity and redundancy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes left, and maybe uh, we'll, we'll go to you, E.K., just to close us off. Looking, uh, taking kind of a, a forward-looking approach, uh, as populations age, what investments in health are required to ensure that an economy can grow? I, I think I've covered some of the areas about uh, health systems and what needs to be done uh, in terms of re reorienting our whole health system. But also in, in very practical terms, because we've been looking at the resources that we have. Each country, in, in fact, put a lot of resources in health. And, and to me, the resources are not well invested, uh, because it's really in terms of what you invest in. In Hong Kong, we, we have been, like in Singapore, because of our segmented health system, we put a lot of money into primary care in the last decade. But it's, it's the way that it's been done, it's been really wasted uh, because it, we've invested the, the money in, but it has, has no impact on access to primary care because we have a very segmented public and primary care. So it's really how we invest, which things we invest, how we design the systems. The design is so important because I'm doing the evaluation for the government of the investments they're put into these two big chunks of uh, primary care uh, systems they're put in. They're, they're put in like... Um, one billion US dollars right, for, for this, and it's produced nothing. Right? It's actually produced nothing because the people still can't access primary care. So it's how we invest and how we then design the systems. We also have problems about technology. We talk about technology driving it. It's really how we harness technology. Technology is driving up costs. It's driving up complexity of health systems because in our systems, and I'm sure it's the same in every country, in developed country, a, a, a patient will be seeing five or six special, specialists for the same presenting illness. So our, our doctors in medicine will be referring from diabetology to, to renal medicine to, to cardiovascular medicine within the same uh, specialty, within the same hospital. And then you, you, each one of them will be, will, be, um, will be diagnosing, will be trying to investigate different aspects. The coordination is the problem. So the management of modern health systems is so complex, right? So, and then within that, obviously, there are going to be a lot of medical incidents, untoward effects, medical, med medical um, 
the related uh, deaths and mortality. So it's really how we actually organize our health systems and not just look at the specialization. In terms of we need to simplify our, the systems we manage, we need to look at our human resource. Every country says they're short of human resources, but are we using our human resources well? Uh, we, yesterday we talked about, looked at about how we, de how we, how we then, uh, things that can be done not, not by professionals will be done by uh, people who are trained to help. But it's not only that, it's really the, to me, the inter more interdisciplinary care. They, you have a group of, 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 the, of healthcare professionals that work together to look at the total needs of a patient. At the moment, we talk about multidisciplinary care, but they're all in silos. They don't work together. We have a lot of uh, services that are, uh, it, that are coordinated for certain things, but not for everything. So it's really how we organize care, how we use our human resources, how we also then get the patients to be part of the care process. So self-management uh, skills are very important because we give a lot of drugs to patients and all the research tells you that 50% of the drugs you, you, you prescribe are not taken by the patients. So that's a lot of waste. So the most important is to understand the, the patient, the person in terms of their preferences, what are how, what their own understanding of illness, their understanding of their health, what are their preferences. It, it's important because each person being given a, a diagnosis, it will impact on him or her very differently. Their preferences are very different. So we really need to then cater for the individuals so they're part of the care process, so there's less waste. So the better you're able to invest those resources in upfront, in terms of time, it's not money, it's time that you give to the patients and your, your understanding of the patient, which is to me the, the key technology that we have not looked at. And, and that's going to be very important going forward because with chronic disease, you're not talk, you're talking about a lifetime illness, a lifetime thing, lifetime follow-up, impact on your life in terms of things, you need to change your lifestyles, and we know how difficult it is. Obesity is the only problem. But how many people succeed in reducing weight? How many of the diabetic patients really are able to comply with treatment? Because changing our behaviors is, is very, very difficult. And we understand ourselves. Can I change my behavior overnight? I can't. Because right? these are things that I used to. These are things I value. I don't really care whether, whether I'm going to have a, a disease, uh, die of it 10 years later. What is important is now. So those are things that we need to understand in terms of our understanding the way that we provide care. So, so, the, um, uh, the, so the more psychological processes, understanding social systems is going to be quite crucial. Sorry. Great. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today, but please uh, give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you very much.